in the basically 1980 because Stu Brody had published this paper how oh don't do that I don't think that's going to just slide on there but okay the um, that the circadian rhythm in neurospora the 24 hour cycle could be the sporulation cycle could be controlled by the mitochondrial F1 F0 ATP synthase and I was a new graduate student and um, the question of big questions solving the circadian rhythm seemed like a reasonable question and Tom and Joyce Heckman had published a paper on neurospora mitochondria so it seemed obvious to me that I should go to Tom's lab and understand nuclear mitochondrial interactions and solve circadian rhythms and in fact my first and many of you remember these reports who were in Tom and Gobin's lab this is my first report typed on an IBM Selectric and the words that are still here many years later neurospora crossa in vitro translation and n crossa mRNA and protein synthesis so I probably have not strayed very far from my beginnings and now I'm going to go into in our good beginnings and one thing that Dieter mentioned and others have mentioned to not go unremarked again is the rigor that that Gobind and Tom brought to science. We all know now about oh, just getting the result, getting the figure for the paper versus really understanding the system. With that said, eukaryotic mRNA has a cap and a poly A tail and a schematically the small subunit joins at the cap and then let's see this is really on the wrong side and then goes and finds an initiation codon, typically an AUG, initiates when the 60S joins, and then elongates and terminates. And this is an image of our RNA circularized. And I'm going to take now a little bit of a investigation into initiation because it's one of those topics that our eyes tend to get glazed over when we think about initiation. But fairly simply, I'll look at the initiation factors. I won't say EIF, I'll just say 3 for EIF3. But we have a small subunit. We have a bunch of initiation factors. Um, Umesh mentioned IF2 and GTP in initiator tRNA. Here we have EIF2, GTP in initiator tRNA. They come together and they form this 43S pre-initiation complex which loads at the cap and and here we're in the GTP bound state so we've loaded at the cap and it's now a 48S because the mRNA is there just resuming here we begin scanning and I wanted to go into a little bit of detail here because of things that we say that turn out on close examination to be a little different than what we thought Many of us even teach in biochemistry, GTP to GDP hydrolysis is the trigger for the reaction. What John Lohr showed very beautifully, and Katsurasano and I did a commentary on it, was that GTP and GDP plus PI exist in a metastable state in the scanning ribosome. And when an AUG is found, in this case an AUG, when an initiator is found, that triggers the release of EIF1 and then the phosphate leaves. And that's the trigger. So it's not that GTP hydrolysis is the trigger, the release of PI is the trigger. Some of us may say a very small point, but for some of us it's a very big point. Yes. So this is a more modern view. This is from Alan Hinnebush's paper, and I've just put our depictions underneath where we have, and there, where we have a 43S pre-initiation complex, loads on the RNA. And here, notice it's scanned past, in this open conformation, scanned past a UUG. And then when it finds the AUG, once again, EIF1 leaves, phosphate leaves, and now we move to a closed complex and just taking that closed complex here we then have subunit joining and initiation begins so the first question is how do you choose an initiation codon and 
what I'll say here is Marilyn Kozak in the 1970s, 1980s, some of the original work showed that you have preferred initiation contexts, and these are often called Kozak consensus contexts. And overall, an A at minus 3 and a G at plus 4. And those of us who aren't computer biologists don't understand this, but biologists say plus 1 and minus 1 with no 0. Right? So there's no zero here. Just go from the plus one AUG to the minus one. So it's terrible in some senses, but you, if you know it, you're fine. So if we look in Neurospora, it's very similar. So what happens, right? Many people who work in bacteria know that AUG is not the only initiation codon, but in eukaryotes, it's only now really widely appreciated that that's the case. So, so work a couple years ago we did where we basically put luciferase reporters with all of what are called the near cognate initiation codons in to drive luciferase synthesis. So each of these differs from the ATG in an RNA code, the AUG, by a single nucleotide. And there's our control differing by two, this lysine codon should not initiate. And um, with Avelo Ivanov, a longtime collaborator, and John Atkins, we also did very similar work in mammalian cells. And of course, what you see immediately is in a good initiation context, CUG is a pretty good initiator. Right? Now, how often do we talk about CUG initiated proteins? Not so often. And I'll return to that. But one thing I just want to draw your attention to here, if you change that second position of a near cognate to a purine, you're basically, as we would say humorously, dead meat. Right? So if you're going to do mutagenesis of a start codon, you could change it to a stop codon, change it, put a second position change here. Otherwise, there's a good possibility for some synthesis. Okay, that's part one, just to get a sense of initiation. Part two is, and certainly in 1980, and the idea was that eukaryotic mRNAs have a single AUG codon and a single reading frame. Now we know upwards of an order of 50% of mRNAs have short upstream open reading frames. And they, their purposes are multi or not at all. In the fungi, we're at about the 22% range, and these are AUG initiated. So what do these do? Obviously, they could have coding capacity, but they certainly have regulatory capacity. First, because of the nature of scanning, you could simply reduce downstream initiation by putting in some upstream initiation. So I'll simply call this preemptive initiation. If you initiate here, and you don't have an efficient reinitiation mechanism, and we'll come to that, then basically you reduce downstream gene expression. That's kind of like the de, de facto one way it could work. I spent a good 20 years studying ribosome stalling at an upstream open reading frame termination codon. This is a regulatory stall. And I'm going to show you some of these in some of the data for this, and some of how now we can use evolutionary conservation to maybe be able to hone in on what URFs, I'll just call them morphs, what URFs have that could have this capacity. Genetics in Saccharomyces in the 1970s and my group's work in the 1990s asking for the loss of arginine inhibition of the first enzyme in arginine biosynthesis's translation, well, actually just its expression, revealed an upstream open reading frame and that a mutation at this aspartic acid in either of them removed arginine-specific negative control. First gene in arginine biosynthesis, not enzyme feedback inhibition, but literally shutting down gene expression. It turns out this is through the ribosome stall, and that ribosome stall also triggers nonsense-mediated mRNA decay. Those of us of a certain age remember attenuation. 
This is, in a sense, like attenuation, but it's at the level of RNA stability instead of, instead of allowing tr transcription and elongation to continue. So historically, 1944, which is three years after Beadle and Tatum's 1941 paper, the ARG2 gene was discovered. And I, I like to show this slide because it says in the abstract that for studies of intermediary metabolism, the new science of genetics furnishes a very powerful method. Now, 1940s, I know for some of us in the audience, might as well have been, you know, a long time ago. But it isn't. It's, um, and in fact, this is shown now. And now, of course, we think of systems biology, proteomics, and genomics as very powerful methods. So here we have the model for how the stalling, low arginine versus high arginine, triggers basic, well, there's two things. It stops ribosomes from getting to here. And I want to point out that this initiation codon is in a very poor context. So most ribosomes go by it. But if they find it, then, and there's arginine in the cytoplasm, then they stop. And now, if you simply, instead of doing alanine scanning mutagenesis, you look over a billion years of evolution, the chytrids and the Paziza mycotina, which include Neurospora, you see this very strongly conserved region of these peptides. So for a billion years, it's been like this. And if you do the alanine and proline scanning, this is the region that's important. And what you can see, hopefully, we will see, is how this peptide acts within the ribosome to make a stall. What I can say is biochemically, we know that arginine itself, and even an RGD tripeptide, can get into a ribosome, a stalled ribosome structure, and trigger a conformational change in the peptide in the ribosome that interferes with the activity of the peptidyl transferase center. So this is a fairly well worked out mechanism for stalling. Now, going not too far forward, inositol, another one of these metabolites, right, of critical importance, 1944, the first inositol biosynthetic gene, which of course is the most important step in inositol biosynthesis, inositol 3-phosphate synthase in Neurospora. Ivelo and I were looking at these sequences, and we saw that there was an upstream open reading frame initiated not with a, an AUG, but an ACG. And if, again, we look over a billion years of evolution, it's highly conserved in the fungi. Not Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but in the other fungi, some of the other Saccharomycotina. And I'm going to come back to these histidine codon, and I'm going to come back to this leucine 6. So what could this be doing? I already showed you with arginine biosynthesis that we could more or less show, using in vitro translation, that it stalled ribosomes. And first of all, just once again, it's in all of the fungi, the, what we call the classic fungi, not in animals. In this the age of translational research, I'd like to think that that still wouldn't matter, but we will know when we know. But if we look at the start codons, once again, they are a variety of near cognate codons. And in the organisms where it is an AUG, it's actually a very poor context COSAC sequence. So there's a U at minus 3 instead of this important A. So presumably, the ribosomes don't often initiate. But when they initiate, our model is that they would stall the ribosomes. And many of you are aware of this technique called ribosome profiling where you can map the positions of ribosomes on mRNAs. And of course, we've done that. And if you look at this inositol RNA, there's the coding region. That's the three prime region. There's not many ribosomes there. But in the five prime, we call it the UTR, the untranslated region. But of course, it's translated. But we're just going to stick with the UTR um, nomenclature anyway, you can see that it is translated and we actually see some evidence for what possibly is internal stalling, but we'll return to that. 
but it's clearly translated in living cells. Just some controls here. There is the arginine attenuator peptide, UORF. And I'm not going to talk about this, but EIF5, one of those critical initiation factors, is auto-regulated. And it has two upstream open reading frames that we've demonstrated are critical for its regulation. Well, OK. So there, now, we have oops, we've fused inositol directly to luciferase and looked in vitro. And what we have shown now is, especially if you look at a good initiator, that you can see an inositol-dependent loss of luciferase synthesis. This is adding just inositol direct. Okay, If we do what's called primer extension inhibition, where instead of making a full-length cDNA, where the ribosomes are located, it blocks expression we can see, in the case of the arginine attenuator peptide, we can see this arginine-dependent stall that's absent in the D12N mutant. And notice if you shorten the uh, upstream open reading frame, you lose regulation. The sequence length is critical. And if we look at the inositol peptide, we can see the stall here. And, and it looks like a stall during elongation. These are the mutants that I pointed out the his his double and the alanine mutant, they no longer show this stalling. So we think what's going on here is that inositol is stalling the ribosome, and this is now another example of a small molecule metabolite controlling translation. Finally, reinitiation, and I'll have to speed up a little bit, where you have the ribosome actually not falling off but reinitiating. The classic example of this is cross-pathway control GCN4, which is a BZIP protein. And in Saccharomyces, many people are familiar with GCN4 and its control. And ultimately, what we see with GCN4 is the ribosomes choose to initiate at URF. They all initiate at URF1. They initiate at 4 or downstream. And we thought that Neurospora was going to be just the same as GCN4. So we did some in vitro experiments, and we saw a larger band, 35-S-methionine, larger band. I won't go through all this. This just shows that the URFs work like they ought to. We were puzzled by this larger band. So when we looked we saw that this reading frame for, G for CPC1 was open. There wasn't a single stop codon in this entire reading frame in over 100 different pazizomycotina. And furthermore, we saw when we did the ribosome profiling that there were lots of signals there in the same frame. And furthermore, when we did the evolutionary analysis, we saw this is the main AUG here, and that's the conservation. There's just as much conservation upstream. And this is also the case in the basidiomycota, where all the different classes of basidiomycota have this open frame one with these near cognate initiators and similar conservation upstream. So what does this mean? We know with mammalian BZIPs, and there's people here, including later on today, talking about BZIP proteins, that you have alternate forms by URF control, by non-AUG initiation control, and there's also other examples unproven yet in the fungi for CUG initiation. So to wrap this up, then, what do we want to say? AUG is not the only initiator, right? We can diversify protein functions. We can increase regulatory capacity. And probably for everybody in the audience, new challenges for functional annotation, right? And in the interest of time, I won't go into too much detail about elongation. But you can control elongation, you can control frame shifting, you can basically control codon preference matters, and 
You can control elongation factor phosphorylation and control rates of movement. Termination, I just showed you some examples of termination. Programmed suppression is crucial for retrovirus um, translation. There's examples where you can make targeting for proxy somes by programmed read-through of a stop codon. And of course, there's RNA quality control mechanisms that sense premature termination. So let me conclude by acknowledging uh, people in my lab and at Texas A&M who have been helpful, especially I work a lot now with Deb Bell Peterson, Ivanov and Tom Deaver. We're working together on the inositol project. And with that, I need to stop and uh, take questions. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually going to start with a question, which is uh, you mentioned inositol regulation, metabolite regulation. I presume that's to coordinate the ability of the cell to kind of respond to the environment, what nutrients are there, and then how many proteins you make in response to that, or how you basically use those nutrients for, for different aspects of metabolism. My question is, why, why inositol as opposed yeah. to something else? Yes, I, I asked this question. The question is, why inositol? Why do this? And I asked this question about arginine because the cell, uh, that's a, uh, that question I have a better answer to, I think. Okay. Because that's fungal fine. cells will put one molar arginine into their vacuole, even in minimal medium. And in fact, the trigger is about 100 micromolar that we see. And that is about the cytoplasmic level of arginine. So presumably it's a homeostatic mechanism that if you have 100 micromolar arginine in the cell, you're happy and you just degrade the message that you made. But if you have less, then you're stabilized. So presumably with inositol, it, it would be a similar kind of mechanism, not an external sensor, but an internal sensor. That's my idea, whether it's true or not, I don't have an answer. But, but you can certainly force, like you were saying about putting in unnatural amino acids, you can put arginine in from the outside yeah. and see an effect. But I don't think that's what it's there okay. for. I had a question as well. Um, so these upstream ORFs, I think you, you didn't mention much the proteins that they may encode. And yes, yes, the dark matter of the universe, yeah. the proteins <laughs> they encode. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and, and Takagaki and I were talking about this a uh, little bit. Um, you know, historically, we only annotate proteins that are larger than 100 amino acids. Right. Right? Yeah. So far as we know, these proteins, we don't have, we don't have an identified genetic function. Mm -hmm. But there are multiple examples now of UORF-encoded proteins that have physiological functions mm -hmm. besides acting as cis-acting regulators of the mm -hmm. downstream right, translation right, right. unit. So that's something for the future and uh, new yes. methods to analyze that. Yes. Because computer algorithms won't do it. I mean, there's not enough signal, I guess, to annotate those reliably. That's a, that's a great question, too. So what's happening now is with respect to annotation, and um, many groups are using the ribosome profiling data to at least get some kind of truth statement with respect to whether or not they are there's evidence for their translation, as opposed to just their existence as an upstream AUG. But yes, it does, it's annotation issues. Yeah. Richard. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah. I'm not sure we're here. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, yes. All right. So uh, actually, uh, I just wanted to share something and then wanted to ask a question. Uh, like, you know, if you take a simple 100 amino acid protein and uh, you know, if you make all the permutations and combinations with all the available amino acids, you're going to have a 20 power 100 combinations of proteins. That's a very small, uh, you know, protein. We have got 1,000 amino acid proteins as well. So, uh, but uh, we just have, you know, approximately, you know, 10 power 80 atoms in the universe. I mean, so, I mean, how, you know, only... Uh, if you look at all the combinations available, uh, in about 6 lakh proteins, one protein is in existence. Not all the combinations are made uh, uh, on Earth, actually. So, uh, can you relate this thing with, you know, the preferences of, you know, translation over some codons? And why only specific proteins have come into existence, not all? 
had it been a stochastic uh, mechanism then why all the proteins did not come oh yeah this i mean no it's i mean that is that is a it is a great question because we tend not to ask these kinds of questions right <laughs> and 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 it is bec and it's the same way i mean and i'm just going to of course change it into my question which is probably not fair but you know when you think you know w you know the question of big the question of big questions right and Marsha kind of also got it, you know, a billion years, you know, why have fungi wanted to sense inositol in this way? And how could you even get such a sensing mechanism? You know, one of the arguments for URF evolution is, is not a positive one. It's that if you get an AUG mutation in a five prime UTR, then you've got problems because you're no longer making your protein because you're initiating upstream. And if you make a long protein, you don't reinitiate. So the idea is you get stop codons as the simplest way to suppress that upstream AUG. But then somehow from there, now you have to select a structure that can bind arginine. I mean, that's not so obvious. So even with the small UORFs, which is a shorter version of your problem, right? I think now the way the field is looking is to look at the ones that have evolutionarily conserved sequence elements to at least try to understand what those domains might do. How about uh, saying that they might have come, but not selected? The, uh, but uh, uh, actually, they, uh, they might have come, but if, they would have come. I mean, you know, I mean, they you, might have come, but not selected. Uh, mm -hmm. because, because right. yes, yes. So it's the retention. Yeah. It's a retention, right? So, in fact, we, that was a question we had for uh, the part that uh, I, I did go just 22 minutes, I might add, so <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> so, right? so, um, so, but I did speed up a little bit and I went over it quickly. Um, that was an important part for the CPC1 when we were looking at that upstream yeah. thing. I didn't show you that it's published now, but each of those... In, near cognate initiators isn't only one. There's like six of them and you can knock out one and then you see other forms. And so that was a question, right? I mean, is if you do the synonymous versus non-synonymous DNDS calculations, at least for that region, we see evidence that it is being maintained as peptide sequence. And that's the best we can do now. Selection. Yeah, there is some selection for those. By yes. By yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, like uh, if you uh, look at uh, the peptide transfer center, mm -hmm. uh, in the 50 angstrom radius, there is no peptide at the peptide transfer center. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to know that you know why are we not talking much about you know uh, the 23s ribosomal RNA regulation? Right. Why am I not talking about it? Because we we've actually done work with um, with. Um, groups um, working on TNAC, which is the E. coli tryptophanase U up leader peptide that stalls ribosomes in response to tryptophan using Kathy Squire's Delta-7 rRNA strain, where we could select and make mutants in that region of the ribosomal RNA. So we could look very specifically at the rRNA you know, universe. The problem is with the nucleolus and multiple copies of the rRNA. Some yeast workers are now work have figured out how to do that, but we haven't in Neurospora at this point. But yes, that that is a great space to look at. The problem is multiple copies of the rRNA kind of mitigate against. Well, that. I mean, just a small thing. If you look at the proteins of uh, ribosomes, and you know, if you break it down into smaller peptides. Uh, they are just, you know, mere repetitions of, you know, small peptides. And those, you know, peptides are also found in the normal proteins of the cell, if you see. I mean, how the protein got a uh, dimensional structure would be a repetition of these smaller peptides. And then the small peptides won't have any dimensional structure as such. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so I, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but one aspect of these peptides is that they are cis-active only during synthesis. So there's a very high local concentration. It's stoichiometric there 
at that moment. And that was a little bit about Nico's question earlier. These are cisacting regulatory peptides. These are not diffusible transacting peptides because that, that, that's, that's not an explanation, but that's a rationale for 